Hi everyone, this video is part five of the 2A series on perception and thought processes from the unit two cognition unit for AP psychology students. This particular lesson will focus on psychometrics. So let's place this video into the context of unit two. Right now we're working through the series called 2A and we've gone through four parts. The most recent part you learned about the theories of intelligence and the history of intelligence testing. Today we'll finish with our last video in this series and you'll learn a little bit about how test makers today make good psychological assessments. And we'll also focus on a few topics related to achievement. Throughout this video, I will explain a few major themes that are related to psychological testing. By the end, you should be able to answer the questions on this screen. All of the concepts listed here will be explained throughout the lesson. By the end, you should be able to define and describe them. So this video lesson is titled Psychometrics. Let's start by defining that word. First, we can break it down into its roots. The first part of the word is psych or psycho, which is referring to the mind. And metrics is referring to measurements. So psychometrics is an area of psychology that focuses on psychological testing. In psychology, we can assess many different types of mental abilities. We can test cognitive factors like intelligence, clinical factors like mental health, and we can even test for personality traits. In this particular part of the curriculum, though, we're focusing on assessments that test intelligence and achievement. Now, in order for a test to be widely accepted and trusted in the scientific and psychological community, psychological tests need to have three principles. They should be standardized, they should be reliable, and they should be valid. On this slide, I'll focus on the first principle of standardization. A test that is a good test should be standardized. This means that the test itself and the way that it is administered is uniform. This ensures that all students who take this test have a similar experience during the test. For example, in standardized tests, students or test takers will get the same set of instructions that are read to them in the same way. And every person who takes the test gets the same amount of time. Since the conditions are kept the same, it's easier to compare scores between the test takers, even if they took the test in different schools or in different locations. Standardization helps ensure that comparisons between scores are fair and meaningful. So this first guideline for good psychological tests is that it should be standardized. Now, standardized test results are normed. This makes the scores more meaningful. For example, when you take a standardized test, your results usually make the most sense when you compare them to others who have taken the same test. For example, if you were to take an IQ test and your results told you that you had a score of 115, this score might not really mean much to you if you're not able to compare it to others who have also taken the same IQ test. So being able to compare your score helps you better understand whether your score is normal or if your score is outside the typical range. So another factor of standardization is norming. And if a test is normed, this means that the test creators started by by giving their test to a large representative sample of people to find out what normal or average was in relation to the scores, and in this particular assessment, what an average score was. So by testing a large diverse sample group, the test makers can see how most people score on that test. And this helps them determine what is considered an average score and what scores are considered less common for that test. Once they have this sample data, they can create a normal distribution curve or a bell curve so that future test takers can compare their scores to this curve and see how they measure up against the average person who has taken this test. And as you learned in the previous video, IQ tests assign the score of 100 to represent the average or expected for that particular age group. To keep the average score near 100, the Stanford Binet and the Weichler scales are periodically re-standardized. This means that if you recently took the WACE, fourth edition, your score was compared to the most recent performance sample, which was tested in 2007, not the first sample that was tested in the 1930s. Now, before moving on, let's do a little bit of review on distribution curves. So in unit zero, you learned that this shape is called a bell curve or a normal curve. This bell curve shows how people score on IQ tests. The X 
axis or the horizontal axis represents the intelligence scores, while the vertical Y axis shows the number of people who received each score. Let's look at the waste data curve to understand standard deviation. So first, what does standard deviation tell us? Well, standard deviation shows how spread out scores are from the average score or the mean score. Here, the average IQ score is 100 and the standard deviation is 15 points, meaning most scores fall within 15 points above or below 100. The next question you might be thinking is, do I need to be able to calculate standard deviation? And the answer is no. AP Psychology students do not need to be able to calculate standard deviation, but rather explain what it means. So what can standard deviation tell us in a data distribution curve? Well, in this particular curve for IQ, what we're looking at is about 68% of scores are falling within one standard deviation of the mean. This ranges from 85 points to 115 points as a score. 95% of the data points are falling within two standard deviations. This is between a score of 70 and a score of 130. And 99.7% fall within three standard deviations of the mean. And for IQ, that is a score of 55 to 145. Scores beyond 130 or below 70 are rare and are considered outliers. Comparing a student's IQ score to this curve can help schools understand if they fall within normal abilities or if that student might need extra support. This concept helps us see where individuals stand in comparison to the average, and IQ scores typically fall in this normal curve where most scores are clustering around the mean. Now, when we talk about good mental abilities tests or good psychological tests, one important quality that we look for is reliability. Reliability refers to how consistent the test results are. Or in other words, a reliable test is one that would give similar results if we were to administer it multiple times or split up into different parts. For example, if you were to take a personality test and each time you took the test, you got different results that would be an unreliable personality test. Or if you took an IQ test and got widely different scores each time you took it, it would be hard to trust the results because they'd be unreliable. One way to measure reliability is test retest reliability. And this method assesses the consistency of test scores over time. If we administer the same test to the same group of people on different occasions and their scores are similar each time, then this shows that the test produces stable or reliable results. For instance, if a student takes an IQ test now and then takes the same test again a few weeks later under the same conditions, then their results should be relatively similar. And this would show test Test, retest reliability. The next set of reliability standards is called split half reliability. This is another important type of reliability, and this method can show us how reliable our test is from beginning to end. It involves dividing the test into two equal halves. Then after administering the test, you would compare the scores from each half to see how closely they match. If the scores are similar, it indicates that the test is reliable. For example, on the screen, you can see a test of 100 questions was given to three different students. The test was split in half and each half was scored separately. If the students in this sample have similar scores between their first half and second half, then we can say that the test is consistent or reliable. So in summary, split half reliability checks to see if different parts of a test give consistent results, while test retest reliability examines if the same test produces similar scores over time. Both methods help ensure that the tests use trustworthy um, techniques in measuring mental abilities. When we evaluate good mental abilities tests, Another important quality to consider is validity. Validity refers to how well a test measures what it's supposed to measure. In simpler terms, a valid test accurately reflects 
what it claims. So imagine you are measuring the heights of people in your class for a project and you gravitate measure from the industrial technology teacher's classroom and without realizing it, you pick up their faulty tape measure, the one that they use for demonstrations. And this tape measure has a misprint on it and it skips the number eight on the inches side. So when you go to measure each of your classmates, everyone measures one inch shorter than they really are. Your measurements would be reliable and consistent no matter how many times you measure, the individuals will get the same measurement every time. Your height results will not be accurate or valid because they're not accurately reflecting their true height. So this highlights the difference between validity and reliability. Both are important concepts when talking about assessments, but they're similar and often easily confused. There are two types of validity that you need to know. The first is construct validity. Construct validity determines whether a test truly measures the psychological construct it claims to measure, like intelligence. Construct validity is, is helping us understand if the test is measuring what it's intended to measure. So if a math test is measuring mathematical skills, but it uses complex vocabulary that hinders students' understanding of the questions, then it might not accurately measure their math abilities. Instead, it might actually be assessing their reading comprehension and vocabulary skills. And this misalignment indicates that the test is not valid and doesn't have construct validity. The next important type of validity is predictive validity. Predictive validity measures how well a test can predict future performance or future outcomes, or in other words, how well a test can predict the behavior or ability it's designed to predict. For example, if a driver's test is valid, it should be able to predict a student's success at driving or how well they were, will perform on the road. If students who score high on a driver's test then are really terrible drivers, then we would say that it has weak predictive validity. Predictive validity just shows us how well a test can forecast future performance, while construct validity ensures that the test accurately measures what it is intended to measure. Both types of validity help confirm that the tests we are using are effective and meaningful in assessing the particular mental abilities. So now let's zoom out a little bit. Here are a few concepts that you should know that relate to mental abilities in testing. For the remainder of the video, we're going to zoom out into some broader concepts just about testing in general. Like how do the tests students take at school fit into this conversation? And are our genetics and environment playing a role in our intelligence? And how does mindset and motivation affect our achievement? So let's start with two important types of tests, tests that you probably are more familiar with. These types of tests are achievement tests and aptitude tests. So first let's talk about achievement tests. Achievement tests measure what a person has already learned or mastered in a specific subject area. They're designed to check the knowledge and skills that have been taught and therefore assessed to figure out what has been achieved or acquired. A common example of an achievement test are state standardized tests. These evaluate the knowledge that students have acquired in a subject at the end of a school year, like math or reading at the end of an academic year. So now let's talk about aptitude tests. Aptitude tests are designed to measure a person's potential or their ability to learn or perform a specific task in the future. Unlike achievement tests, they do not assess what someone has already learned, but rather they're designed to predict future success. Results from aptitude tests can help people better understand what jobs they're suited for or how they will perform in different areas. Real world examples of aptitude tests are the SAT, which is a test that helps measure a student's readiness for college. Another example is the ASVAB or the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, which helps determine eligibility and suitability for military careers based on various aptitudes. Then there's the GRE, after you get a bachelor's degree in college, if you decide to go on to graduate school, your program might require you to take the GRE or the graduate record exam. This aptitude test predicts your readiness for graduate school, and it tests your critical thinking, analytical writing, verbal and quantitative reasoning skills, and this helps predict how successful you will be in a graduate program. In summary, achievement tests measure what you've learned, usually focusing on a specific subject area, while aptitude tests 
assess future or potential performance, usually in broader skill areas. Both types of tests are important in education and in career planning. So how does nature and nurture play a role in our intelligence? Both genes and the environment play a role in shaping our intelligence. Heritability is the extent to which differences in a trait, like intelligence, within a group are due to genetic differences. The heritability of intelligence is relatively high, typically ranging from 50 to 80%. This means when we compare people's intelligence scores, about 50 to 80% of the differences can be traced back to genetic variation. Environment also plays a role. Twin and adoption studies help us understand this balance between genes and the environment. For example, identical twins who share the same genes tend to have very similar intelligence scores, even when they are raised in separate households in separate families. This suggests a strong genetic influence on intelligence. Adoption studies show that children adopted into more supportive environments have higher intelligence scores than those who remain in challenging conditions. However, it is important to note that as adopted children grow older, their intelligence scores tend to resemble those of their biological parents more than their adoptive families. This just highlights the long-term impact of genetics on intelligence. These studies show how both nature and nurture shape our intellectual abilities. Now, before moving on, let's take a look at the bar graph on the screen. Notice across the x-axis, this shows different groups of people. Identical twins raised together, identical twins raised apart, fraternal twins raised together, siblings raised together, and unrelated individuals raised together. On the vertical y-axis, you can see the similarity between their intelligence scores represented as a correlation coefficient. I want for you to take a second and pause the video and make a conclusion about what this tells us about our environment and our intelligence and our genes. So you might have noticed that there's a high similarity in intelligence scores between identical twins, even when they're raised apart. This suggests that genes are a significant factor in determining intelligence. However, the slightly lower similarity in identical twins raised apart compared to those raised together indicates that environment does have an impact. The lower similarity between fraternal twins and siblings, even when they're raised together, further, further just highlights that sharing an environment can make people more alike. Genetic differences still lead to variations in our intelligence. And the lowest similarity between unrelated individuals raised together shows that simply sharing an environment has limited effect if there's no genetic relationship. So how does our mindset relate to our achievement? As you might assume, your intelligence and your schooling interact with one another, but what we accomplish with our intelligence depends on our beliefs and our internal motivations. A 2008 study of over 72,000 college students found that motivation and study skills were just as important as intelligence and past grades in predicting how well students performed in school. Carol Dweck is a researcher who studies how mindset relates to our achievement. The two mindsets she observed are growth mindsets, which is when you believe that your abilities can grow and evolve and that they're not set and determined, but have the capacity to increase and develop. And the other mindset she called fixed mindset. And this is the belief that your abilities are set, that you're born with them, they cannot grow or change. She found that a growth mindset doesn't change your intelligence, but it can make children more resilient when confronted with difficult learning material. One 2019 study of over 6,320 lower achieving U.S. high school students showed that viewing a 25 minute video fostering a growth mindset actually modestly improved their grades. So mindset isn't everything when we're looking at achievement, but it does matter and it can allow you to harness your own individual potential. So let's finish today's video with a few questions for review. Remember that I'll read the questions and not the answers. So be sure to pause the video for a little extra time to determine the correct response. Question number one says, test developers often define uniform testing procedures and meaningful scores by comparing individual scores with the performance of a pre-tested group. Which of the following best describes this process? Question number two says, Dr. Asimov's new intelligence test yields consistent results upon retesting. So it has a high degree of. Question number three says, Ms. Skipworth gave her algebra class a quiz on some of the material they learned last week. What type of test did Ms. Skipworth give? 
Question number four says, Mr. Guyman shows his class the visual statistical representation of IQ scores in a data distribution, showing a typical representation of intelligence scores relative to the mean. What did Mr. Guyman show his class? This concludes today's video lesson on psychometrics. Listed on the left-hand side of the screen are the answers to the review questions, and on the right are the questions and concepts that were covered in today's video. Before finishing up, take a moment to check your understanding of these essential elements of today's video.